You are listening to Force Majeure, an actual play Star Wars podcast. My name is Adam and I'm your host, and today's episode will be brought to you after these words from our sponsors. Hello, are you fond of droids? If you, like me, are fond of droids, then why not subscribe to Fond of Droids, a Hollandette magazine for people who are fond of droids. Which droid is your favourite? Which droid is your least favourite, but still very nice? These questions and more can be found in Fond of Droids magazine. Fond of Droids magazine. For people like you who are fond of droids. Hello everybody and welcome back to episode 17 of the Cold Fire Chronicles. Uh, My name's Adam. I am the GM for this constant cavalcade of shenanigans and terrible rolling. And I am joined around the table by... My name is Ed Fortune and for this session... I am playing the character of Auburn Brick. He is a human hunter seeker. His emotional strength is justice and his weakness is cruelty. Hi, I'm Ross. I'm playing Agatha, a morale and warrior aggressor whose emotional strength is his pride, whose weakness is his anger. Hi, I'm Mikey. I'm playing Jiren. He's a chiss mystic advisor whose emotional strength is his enthusiasm, but his emotional weakness is his recklessness. Hi, I'm Mim. I'm playing the very embarrassed and shamed Lassa. She is a human sentinel artisan idiot. Her emotional strength (laughs) is her curiosity. Her emotional weakness is her obsession. And her player weakness is dice rolling ability. (laughs) And before we get going, do we have a question from our characters? Adam, are these dice cursed? (laughs) (laughs) Why? Yes, yes, they're mims. (laughs) Lassa, on Port Haven, you took Steve's head as a trophy. Do you not want any trophies from this ship? No, my love, I don't take trophies. I took it because I needed it to see what was happening. Like tracing the history of the droid through who owned it and what had been programmed into it, where it came from. It's very much, I took it because it was a useful computer part. I don't, I don't do trophies. That's more, that's the Oberon's area, I feel. I'll miss him. Speaking of which... I could have just trophies. Or will do, eventually. <laughs> We open from the outside, an exterior shot. We see the asteroid. We see the cost of the bar and still moored on the asteroid. And we now know that to be affixed in place by the tunnel that led down into the heart of the asteroid. The caverns beneath and the horrors that were in there. We see the star sprite still nestled underneath the wing of the cost of the bar. We see the pathfinder gently drifting off into the void, nudged by Coldfire's mercy which is coming into position. We see the boarding tube still attached to the Pathfinder, gently floating into the void. And then our camera focuses in to see Oberon in the darkness of the boarding tube, still attached to the Pathfinder as it gently floats into the void. Now Oberon, you certainly heard the clinking of the clamps disconnecting. You had long enough to realize, wait a minute, that came from below rather than above. And then you felt the impact of Well, uh, you felt an impact, you bounced off the side of the tube, and then you can now feel movement. A voice comes over the comms. Um, so I thought the plan was that we were going to connect to the docking tube. That's right. That's what I thought the plan was as well. Right, um, I don't know how or where you are in there, but, um, it doesn't look like that's presently a viable plan. Well, I'm currently in the docking tube. Oh, um... (laughs) Am I right in thinking that the docking tube is connected to the Pathfinder? Yeah. And not the Costa Favara? Yeah. What did you do? So I'm currently going... Into the asteroid field. Great. Yeah. Um... It's okay. He's a good pilot. Uh... uh, There's there's no power to the... He's a very good pilot. I use all the information that was given to me through my advantage to explain to Pijak why this completely isn't my fault. Um, <laughs> Go on then. You're not lying. It isn't your fault. Right. Uh, okay. What, what do you want me to try and do? Have you got enough air in there for me to try? Oh, I don't even know. Uh, we can uh, tug her. Do you think you're going to be able to do something about that Pathfinder and, and get it back before it flies into the asteroid field? I think I can fix this. How, how hard did you nudge it? I mean, not massively hard, but inertia. Do we need the tube? 
Not if, um, if Agatha can hold his breath and wrap up warm. What if, what fine. if, right, Pijack, what if you went and flew alongside and connected to the flappy free tube and then unhitched it and then just reattached it back over here? All right, it's a drive-by connection, but you've got Oberon. I'm sure he can hold it steady or something. Okay, what I'd like to do is I'm going to open this tube, he says over the comms. All right. I'm going to aim my grapnel, because I still think I have enough range, to the aft side, and then I'd like you to let me in. We still need the tube. <laughs> yeah, um... The tube's part of the plan. Okay. Oberon, as well, if you open the tube, there's air in there, right? Oh, wait. Can you still detach the Pathfinder from the tube? I mean, I can Pathfinders are wonderful ships, by the way. They're usually the first ship a captain gets. Can Lassa disconnect the tube from the Pathfinder from a range as well, so that it's just the tube floating in space? At the moment, it's out of Wi-Fi range. Is there a manual for me to do that? Uh, yes, there probably is. Yeah, yeah, I'll say so. Right, unless someone says this is a terrible idea, I'm about to disconnect the tube from the Pathfinder. I don't think it's a terrible idea, but I don't think you should be asking me. Click. Can you <laughs> can you make me a mechanics test, please, Ed? No. <laughs> the answer is yes, but not very well. It is uh, two purple and one black. Stop using Adam's can dice. Can I provide him with a boost because we're on comms and I can talk him through? Yes, I will. An easier way of doing this. Yep, absolutely. And I'm going to be very kind and not spend a dark side point to upgrade this roll. So is that an additional blue? Yeah. Would you like to use a light side point? You can use a light side point to upgrade one of your greens to a yellow. Yes, please. It didn't work for me. <laughs> Lassa, it's very dark. I can't really see the colours. When you say green, do you mean the one that's normally on the left or the one that's normally on the right? All right, you if have you a torch. touch it, you can turn the torch on. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> if it helps, it's normally a uh, third button row in and then two down if you ignore the switch. So that's uh, a failure and six advantage. Okay. Did you remember that A is B and B is A? <laughs> well, you are not able to disconnect the boarding tube. It looks like the manual controls on this side of it are to open or close it, not to disconnect it, because it's from the ship. If you now want to disconnect the boarding tube, you're going to need to do it from inside the Pathfinder. But you've got six advantage, so... I'd like to realise mm -hmm. that there is power in the boarding tube. Okay. And that I can route the power in the boarding tube to give me one shot with the Pathfinder? Okay. If you can only open this thing from inside the Pathfinder, it might be nice to open the door to the Pathfinder again, because otherwise you're locked on the side you're not where it's not working. I was going to manually open the door using the manual open. Okay. Saving myself some power. Okay. And then use the tiny squirt of power left from the the boarding tube. Yep. Which might cause it to demagnetize, I have no idea, to maneuver the Pathfinder. Okay. Like, I have it. It's like literally the tiniest squirt of okay. energy left. I think that that's going to take three of your advantage to have enough power left to do a manoeuvre with the Pathfinder. Okay. I think one advantage to be able to basically get the manual lock open and entirely in the Pathfinder without needing a further roll for that. That leaves you two advantage. Can I save that for my next roll? You can have boost die on your next roll. Yeah. yeah. Two boost die on your next roll. Two boost die on my next roll. Okay. Basically, I'm, I'm using the, the remaining two advantage to do this at the right angle. So you can hear him go, 10, 9, 8, 7, Criff, 10, 9, 8, because I'm trying to get the timings right. What is it you're intending to do? What's your plan? I'm going to get into the ship. Yep. I'm going to get closer to the Cold Fire's Mercy. Can I have a land, which means I stop drifting, mm -hmm. or one manoeuvre, so I can't dock with the Cold Fire's Mercy. That's too, too much of a manoeuvre. Yeah. But I could land. Yes. So I'll land. Okay. Because at least that means I'm not lost in space. That might break the docking tube, depending on what you roll. Okay. We'll have to see that, okay? So I think you've got limited power. You are currently have momentum from being knocked by the Cold Fire's Mercy. I'm also going to flip a dark side point, and I think your difficulty for this manoeuvre is two purple and a red. I'm not going to put any setback die on there for your lack of power, because, you know, that that's why you're able to do it at all. That's three successes, plus one threat. Three successes and a threat. You are able to to land. It's not so much a, a proper powered landing, because the engines have also been looted out of here to provide power to Mr. Flesh's complex. I've rerouted it so it's vented coolant. Yep. 
and that's provided the momentum down. You are able to land on the asteroid. You're a bit ahead of the cost of the bar and because you were moving, the threat is that it's going to break the boarding tube as you land because it's sticking out quite far and you, you come in a bit gracelessly to land. But yeah, you are secure now on the asteroid. The landing gear has, has engaged as you've landed it and, and is holding you on the asteroid. And you're a brisk spacewalk back to the cost of the Baron or the Cold Fire's Mercy. And what it looks like is, as I view the coolant, that was yeah. the only thing that was keeping it together. Yeah. So it explodes. The panel just yeah. pops. And the uh, the docking tube kind of crumples as you land. Oberon, we uh, we can't see what's going on. How are you doing? Are you dead yet? I've landed the Pathfinder. How? There's no... Well, that was impressive. I rerouted the co- coolant using the remaining power from the docking tube and gave me enough for us to land. And I've survived, so it's a good landing. Uh, I don't think we'll be able to use that docking tube, though. It, it's kind of cushioned the landing. That's fine. I mean, we can we can still connect with the docking tube we have on, um, on the coal fire, I'm sure. Can you get it back to us? I can get back to you. Go to the coal fire. The coal fire doesn't have a docking tube per se, but what it can do is now land on top of the cost of the bar run and open up its airlock. So you'll have to climb out of the hole in the top where the docking tube was and in and out, but it's not a difficult jump. It's just that it will be through the void. To be honest, if he lines it up well, we'll yeah. just open the door and he's, if, if the and airlock's already in, we'll pop out and go yep. straight into the airlock. So, if he doesn't line it up well, we get put into deep space, but that's that's the risk we take. And what's the risk going to be for Agatha and the lack of suit? Well, he'll go straight into the airlock and we just close it. So we'll be out in space for seconds. Okay. Is there a sort of force leap manoeuvre we want to do to make to you know, increase my chances of getting there quickly? You don't want to go any more quickly because you'll hit the airlock really hard and if we miss, you'll go really quick into space. Okay. I'm going to roll for Tugger to try and do the piloting because Pijak isn't a pilot particularly. He had other pilots. He was a, he was a gunner. Yeah. So I'm going to have Tugger make the roll and see what happens. One success and one advantage. He is able to line up the Cold Fire's Mercy close enough that it will not negatively impact Agatha. You're not going to be exposed to the vacuum of space for long enough to do any, any real harm. Okay. Well, you've got my breath mask now, so you can breathe in out there for a short period of time. It's just that you will be open to the vacuum. Yeah, it's exposure rather than uh, so, that's the issue. The plan here is when they say we're ready, you stand there, we open the door, you go, we follow through. Okay. And as soon as we're all in, we close the airlock. Agatha does exactly what he's told. All right. Because Jaren is someone who knows what he's talking about. Yeah, you still haven't learned, have you? I have a cunning of one. <laughs> okay, well, the Coal Fire's Mercy is lined up as optimally as it can be. I think I'm going to want a group, not not counting over on, because uh, you're kind of bouncing along at the moment. Um, for the rest of you, uh, I want a group, either coordination or athletics test. Okay, I'm bringing nothing to the table. What are you guys bringing? I'm bringing lots to athletics. I have no nothing in it, either of them. In which case, have two boost die for Juren and Lassa. The difficulty, I'm going to flip a dark side point, is one purple, one red. There's no setback die because the Cold Fire's Mercy is perfectly aligned. How very fortuitous. I have three success, a threat, but two light side points. So I'm going to use one of the light side points to cancel out the threat. And the other light side point? Let's make it four successes. Okay. I have a dark side point, but I'm not using that. Okay. Yeah, you all, with the assistance of Agatha, managed to make it into the Cold Fire's Mercy's airlock, which then closes behind you. Oberon! Hello! Hello! You're bouncing along as best you can. Can I have a coordination or athletics test from you as well, please? Difficulty is too purple. I will be using coordination because I have that. So while he's doing that, we're going to get out of the airlock just in case he opens it and we fire back. (laughs) Five successes. Yeah, you make it over there in in very, very good time. And you look stylish doing so. And you look stylish doing so. So, as the three of you get uh, out of the airlock onto Coldfire's Mercy and Oberon's bouncing his way along merrily up the side of the cost of the Baron to to join you in there, you are met by a very worried-looking Pijak and a very worried-looking Prinkle. They look at the state of all of you. They then look, notice this, you know, Jaren's missing arm. And, um, so what, what the, what, what was going on in that place? What happened to all? Jaren, my friend, you look like you've had a better day. Come with me, come with me, I would make the tea. Uh, Lassa, the, uh, the workbench is clear, ready for you. 
Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. I, I had a better day. We had, um, it looks like, how do I explain it without sounding mad? Sound mad. Okay, so we entered the uh, the ship and there were these corpses with droid parts in them that attacked us. And a voice over the intercom that went, Flesh! And it was rather terrifying. Um, and I couldn't affect it with anything in the way of the Force. And it looks like the um, people who... The Daphimerians and the pirates and the Jedi all came together, had a big fight, and the bits that were left were made, made into monsters by a uh, amalgamation of a, the bits of the ship and a lightsaber and a holocron, which we have with us now, so we do not plug it in anywhere. And um, then, um, then a load of them pulled my arm off and it gets a bit hazy after that. I don't, I, 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 there's no pain, I don't think. But then again, I've had a lot of stuff. Um, and then there was a thing with big guns and a and um, stuff. And and I'd like to sit down now, please. Yeah, that's. I've never heard anything like that. And I saw some things during during my time. Prinkle takes you by your remaining hand and almost drags you into Lassa's engineering bay, shows you where he's cleared some space, and then runs off again into the galley where you can hear the tea brewer start making various warning noises. Oberon arrives through the airlock. Pijak offers his assistance to anyone that needs it, kind of getting in as well and kind of getting you all settled. He's fully geared in his Mark I armor so his facial expression isn't visible at present he's still like fully togged up and ready to roll i mean i saw some stuff during my time both both with the jedi and then in the work i did after but i've never even heard of anything anything like that i mean i i I, it was pretty dark but it's been dealt with then well yes but now we have an artifact agatha during all this is just going to sit on the floor and just lean back and just breathe that because I think all these stim packs are going to finally start wearing off very soon and he's just going to collapse. Hmm. It's good to have good air as well I imagine. Yeah but at the moment he's just he's not saying anything he's just going to occupy a corner just outside the airlock and just not do anything for for a while. If he starts blocking the way someone may have to drag him to his bunk. There is a bit of, of euphoria for all of you as you take your breath mass off and breathe in the oxygen rich air of the cold fire's mercy you do all get a little bit lightheaded and giddy from it because even with the breath mass that Lassa managed to fix it was still not as as high an oxygen mix you had it so that it would last as long as possible without causing impairment but because of that it was still a bit thinner air now back on here you're back with a decent oxygen mix and I imagine you've all got a little bit euphoric and lightheaded from it I think we need to discuss what we are doing with the for want of a better word the thing to be completely honest Oberon I reckon the thing can wait it's in my bag it's over there if you want to have a look at it fine but I need the arm so I can fix up Duran right and proper I just want to say over the comms is I know I'm sitting here on this very clean workbench but there is an imperial blockade out there and we need to leave can we sort out my arm later they're looking for us you see all right, then let's get in the driving seat and get out of here. Yeah. But seriously, the last priority is the thing that none of us really need to care about right now. Mm. What do you need us to do? I think we need to leave here. I, th- I, I think... So by that, do you mean you are going to the cockpit? I think Duran's completely right. We need to leave here. I'm worried about the cursed thing, but let's leave. Right. I knew we were going to Alpin. So while you've been in there, Tugger's managed to calculate the, the hyperspace calculations to get us there as quickly as possible. We were just waiting on dusting off. He's done that. He's, he's all right, he's Tugger. He's like, wah, 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 wah. Mm. Tugger kind of looked quite proud from his little astromech dog. Instantly, as you walk into the cockpit, there's now a basket on top of Tugger's head, you know, his flat circular head, and Mr. Sparkles is in the basket. It looks less like it used to be one of your tool boxes that's been emptied out and had a blanket in it. And Mr. Sparkles looks at you all, stretches, yawns lazily, kind of gives you all that heavy-lidded look that cats do, and then goes back to sleep. Duren comes back out from the engineering. He still looks pale. One thing we do need to do, and the thing we promised to do, is we need to leave this system noisily. We need to give them chance to uh, chase us, rather than them looking for the base. Can I suggest we blow up the cost of a bone? I'm glad you're on my side eventually. It's it's what I wanted to do from the start. Um, Yes, yes, yes. 
Agatha has this horrible feeling that you're about to ask him to go and look, you do something with the guns, that he has no idea how to, how to work. No, it's fine. Um, I can take the shot. Um, I want you here. Flying. Yeah. Pijak kind of has takes his helmet off. He's like, oh, I can use the guns. He sees that you're looking a little bit uncomfortable about it, Agatha, and he's like, I, I can use the guns, I am a gunner. It's a big target, it's not moving, I reckon it ought to be an easy shot. Now that I'm feeling back more myself compared to how we were when we when we left um, Daxos, I shall be able to take that shot without too much difficulty. Let's get to as far away as possible before you have to take the shot, because I want them looking at the explosion, give us a chance to escape, and then notice so they don't... so it's not as risky, you know? Right. Pijak goes and gets into... You know, climbs the ladder up to the gunnery pod on the top of the ship. Prinkle comes out with a tray with several steaming mugs of tea on, which he then hands around to everybody, and he turns to Lassa and goes, uh, Lassa, my friend, we have the crybaby you made. Do we still want to deploy that, or...? Could be useful to send it off in the opposite direction. Or we could keep it for later. I, I, I don't know, to be honest, I, I wasn't thinking about this. I've, I, I'm already trying to think of what, what we're going to do with Duran, but, uh... Oh, I don't know, what do you think, Duran? Do you want to... Make as much noise as possible. We need to give them chance to escape. We can do an orbit round the asteroid, drop off the crybaby, and while it's going in the opposite direction, we can blow up the cost of a bar and, and then go away from the crybaby. I yeah. can do that. Yeah, I'm happy with that. All right. You have multiple targets. You can fire at the Pathfinder as well. Do what's needed. The important thing is we make noise and we leave. Okay, this is what I'm going to want. From Oberon, since I assume you're piloting, I'm going to want a piloting spacecraft test. It's going to be two purple and two setback because of all of the debris in this asteroid field. But I'm going to give you a boost for the pathways through that Tug has been plotting out for you. Party, do you object to me spending a light time? I don't object. We've got one left. I'm sorry, Ben. I'm clearly not spending them fast enough. Three successes, one advantage. Okay. You take off. You manage to do your orbit. And when you give Pijak the signal... Can I give my advantage to Pijak? Uh, yes, you can. He's going to attempt to blast the Costa, which with that triumph and several successes, he does with no particular difficulties. You put the Coal Fire's Mercy into a spin so it can drop it like you did when you were leaving Daxos. He shoots with the quad lays on top of the Coal Fire's Mercy, and with a whap, 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 the Costa Thabaran explodes. As messily as it can, really, given that most of the power stuff that would cause it to explode have been looted out of it. But it does go bang with a satisfying... Um, Bang. Light show. Light show. <laughs> yes. Given the fact that it's a triumph, do we do enough explosion to set off the power generator? Uh, yes, you do. Yep. Which then you can see the fire boiling out, right? And then as you're pulling away and into the asteroid field itself, the asteroid itself explodes, taking out the Pathfinder and firing an awful lot of tiny, tiny meteorites uh, throughout the area. So what the Imperial should be seeing is a big explosion and the crybaby going in the opposite direction yep. to the direction that we're going in, so they track the thing yep. causing the problem that way. Yep. You breach the asteroid field, you punt out the crybaby. What I do want from you, Lasser, actually, is I want a mechanics test to have the Cold Fire's Mercy go on to silent running enough to get out of sensor range, because otherwise there's going to be two pinks coming up from it. That's fair enough. Uh, the difficulty for this, I'm going to flip a dark side point, is going to be one purple, one red, and one black. The setback die being for the pressure that you're feeling under. Okie dokie. Hey, I got a triumph. We like that symbol. So it is a triumph with one threat. Yep, you get into silent running mode, you get away. What would you like your triumph to be? For the crybaby to go off without difficulty and start making its way through the asteroid field without being hit by asteroids? Y yes, to, for it to go into the into the tricky asteroid field, so it's going to be a long time before they can figure out what what it is, where it's going, and they're all like, "Wow, this guy's a really cool pilot. We're going to make a note that this person is really threatening and scary." Okay, and for the threat, that's going to be a system strain on Coldfire's Mercy from having to keep dropping in and out of silent running because he does put attacks on the life support system. So yeah, that's going to be a system strain on Coldfire's Mercy. You make it through the various asteroid fields of the Linico system. You can see from your, you know, your scanners, the Aquatens cruiser start to move in the direction of the crybaby and the asteroid field. You can pick up on your scanners that there is a lot of encrypted Imperial chatter suddenly kicks off as that's going on. You can feel the sensors, you know, their sensors trying to ping you, but they're not picking you up because you're running on silent running. And then you jump into hyperspace. 
It's going to be a couple of hours before you get to Alpin. What are you doing in that time? Lassa wants to start work with Jiren. While everything's fresh in her mind, and she's particularly motivated to uh, not criff up. Okay. So what exactly is your plans? To adapt the arm taken from the Harvester droid to work as a, as a humanoid cybernetic and then to start attaching that? Yep, that's the plan. Okay. It's going to take a bit of work, so I'll let you make the roll to attempt to basically convert it from a droid part into a cybernetic. You do not have the facilities on Coldfire's Mercy to attach it to him, okay. but you can have it ready for when you get to those facilities. Okay. Most space stations, most bases, anywhere with a decent, actual, dedicated medical bay will have it. It's just that the Coalfire's Mercy does not have a proper, dedicated medical bay. That's fine. But I will let you make the roll to work on the arm. It's a bit tricky, so it's going to be... I'm going to flip a dark side point. One purple and one red, but I'm putting two setback die in there because of the work that Mr. Flesh and his droids had done to this droid when they built it from its original chassis. Okay. Can my custom toolkit come into play here because it will give me a blue to repair any item and I am trying to undo yep. some of the nasty damage that Mr. Flesh has done absolutely. to these. Yep, absolutely. I think because I'm, she's really focused on this, she's been quite worried about Duran. I'm going to spend one of our light side points because we did have excess. Okay to turn that green into another yellow. So two black, a red and a purple versus three yellow and a blue. Let's see how I can crisp this up. I just want you to know personally that your two black dice did nothing for you. <laughs> Don't taunt the GM. So all in all, that's not bad. That is two success and four advantage. Then yes, you are able to retrofit this to work as a replacement limp. You manage to sort out some of the synaptic processes in there, so it will give it will be fully responsive. It won't be like a big clunky prosthetic. It will respond as naturally as his own limbs. You've got four advantages. It still has in at the moment those two kind of medical syringe dispensators in there. I don't know if you want to maybe spend some of those advantages on, on having them as viable stim pack depositors or other chemical injectors. I don't know. Would Jiren be able to use those? automatically as part of having that arm? I mean, would there be an ability he would gain himself? Not inherently. Right, just curious. Not inherently, because it's like an add-on. Yeah. It's, it's an attachment, essentially, mm. so it's not inherently just from using the arm, but it will only cost you one of your four advantages to have that work. Okay, I think it's worth taking it for that. Jiren, do you wear jewellery and stuff on your fingers, or...? Yeah, that's why I wanted you just to keep my arm. I just got the rings on it. And a watch. Did we get the watch? Got it. Okay. We've got the entire arm. It's in the fridge at the moment. It's got half his cufflinks on as well. <laughs> mm, and half my cufflinks. Could I spend an advantage to make this look fashionable? <laughs> yeah. So that it starts to look more like a, a one-off. It fits with his personality. A bespoke prosthetic as opposed to something that you looted from the bowels of a hideous, twisted monstrosity. Yeah, yeah. like I'll, I'll, I'll maybe spend a few of my credits to coat it with some fine gold for conductivity and things like that. Yeah. yeah. Give it a blue chrome polish, because it's blue. <laughs> Thank goodness we don't have near that green dust because it's you know, made it glittery. <laughs> I, I find it interesting what you think is fashionable. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be nice here and I've still got two advantage so can I use those advantage so that I've made this connection really easy so the next test to attach it is you going get to be boost die to it yeah yep absolutely I'm just going to note that down so yes. I don't forget it yep that'd be handy because I'll forget it as well what about the rest of you Agatha is still sitting down in the corridor he's now fallen onto his side he's basically sleeping and the tea is going cold seeing you sleeping Prinkle gently tries to poke you awake. Um, Agatha, my friend, you, you're sleeping on the floor. Agatha is very tired. Would you like maybe to sleep in our bed? Agatha would like that a lot. Okay. Agatha's not moving. I'll, um, do you want me to try to help you to your feet? I mean, I can try. I can borrow maybe a pry bar from Lassa. A tiny pry bar. Agatha would like that. He's okay. th he isn't moving a lot. A few minutes later, you are woken up again by Prinkle who is trying to leverage you to your feet by use of a tiny pry bar. I say tiny, it's perfectly sized for him, but he's quite small as he's trying to... I would like to help Prinkle get Agatha to bed. You're piloting. Am I? Yeah. We're in, oh, we're in You're in hyperspace, space. it's just kind of going on, so oh, yeah. 
Like, it's like, well, you sat there with popcorn, well, apart from me, I'm locked in a room. You just sat there with popcorn watching Prinkle try to move yeah. Agatha. You're like, this will be fun. I'd help, chap. I really would. But, you know, I have space. <laughs> so, yes, you notice Prinkle's kind of struggling trying to get the, the three times his size Agatha off the floor and uh, assist him. <laughs> Thank you, Oberon. I mean, I tried, but he's a little bit too big for me and he's not really helping the process. He's mostly a lump, yes. And they escort you into your bunk room? Put you on your bunk where he stays asleep all right so um what happened in there Oberon? i mean agatha is practically unconscious jaren is disarmed lasser is fractious understandably so what went on I, they were tell zombies i heard as, horrible monstrosities as best i understand it what's happened to your rifle it needs oh, repairing it does it's very sad as best i understand it the artifact that we have recovered corrupted the crew of the old ship. A Jedi at some point came to investigate and made matters worse, and... When you say that, Pringle kind of rolls his eyes and nods. And as far as I can understand it, one of them, perhaps maybe the captain, went insane and was possessed or used the knowledge within the artifact that we now have to um, extend its lifespan in the most uh, well, grisly way I can imagine, through mechanical methods and keeping the dead alive beyond their their natural span. It was ugly in there. We had to deal with horrible things. And this artifact, you say it's on the ship now? In a bag. It's been inert since we disconnected it from everything it was connected to. But it could possibly corrupt people if they're already mad. That's a good point, Prinkle. I'm very worried about myself. Oh, I'm glad you said that. You were not the first name that sprung to mind. You were. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no no offence. You, you all had eccentric lives. I know who I am, Prinkle. Well, I'm starting to know who I am. I'm very worried about this thing. Hmm. Where, where is it? Do you want me to maybe try to build a containment unit for it? I think connecting it to anything is a terrible idea. I oh, meant like a box of lead. A lead box would be a very good idea, Prinkle. Excellent. I don't think I have one, but I can see if I can make something similar. Some sort of inert gas? Well, possibly. Where, where is it, then? Is uh, it? Larsa has it. Okay, I, I might have a word with her when she's finished doing the things she's doing. So, in the engineering room, because I'm not really needed, but I'm supposed to be there, I'm sitting on this clean work surface, staring at the bag. It looks like I'm listening to it. I'm not, I'm zoning out, but it looks like I'm listening to it. Yeah, smash cut too. <laughs> kill, kill them all, you say? <laughs> That's probably open because Lassa would have been in and out of it to pick up little odds and sods mm-hmm. to make this arm look particularly nice. And she is asking for your input about the uh, the arm. That is great. I like that bit. I like the bit where I can inject things with drugs. Or, you know, cocktails. Oh my goodness, could you get an optic built into there? <laughs> into the arm? <laughs> Dispense small glasses. <laughs> You know, I once heard, Duran, that there was a bloke on one of those fashion planets yeah. who, when he lost his hand due to a bad round of cards, oh, yeah. Yeah. terrible at Sabak, he had each of his fingers given with a shot of a fine liqueur inside them. And then when he lost his leg due to another bad round of Sabak, he had it fitted with a golden bird cage with a mechanical bird inside that used to sing all day long. I already got so into it, he ended up getting all different parts of himself replaced, so he was the most unlucky, but most well-known and popular gambler. Yes, if you're a very unlucky gambler, the best thing to do is be known. I think I would like to meet him and play some cards. I think part of him's around here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I think I won part of a fingertip off him one night. I didn't know you played Sebek. Oh, in my youth. In my youth. I have a, a deck here. Would you like to play a, there's a pause, hand? You're terrible, Duran. It's all right. I want to get this finished up, and then we should probably go talk to everybody about the stuff and the things and the farce. Honestly. She spends a lot of time just tutting to herself then. Mm-hmm. kind of want to touch the holocron. I, I kind of want to. At this point, do we cut to Prinkle building some very large tongs? <laughs> well, I tell you what. I mean, I touched it. It's a little tingly. Didn't you touch it through the cloth you have over it? Oh, yeah, but... Around very carefully you can still feel it. Off. It's like a kind of static electricity. I'm good to touch it, you know. All right, I'll be here to separate you if something happens. What's the worst that can happen? Picks up a crowbar. <laughs> <laughs> clang, clang. That'll do. Very carefully, Duran takes a finger and touches the hologram. 
there is a sensation of static electricity kind of courses up your arm. All your hairs stand on end. And that's where we're ending it for this week. This is cut. (laughs) (laughs) Before we finish for today, this episode's patron is the wonderful Leslie, who you might know better as the voice of Kith and or Billy from the Hydean Heroes podcast. Thank you very, very much for your support, Leslie. We really do appreciate it. And we're glad that you're enjoying our show as much as we're enjoying yours. Yeah. Wow. Leslie is, is wonderful. Excellent Le- stuff. Yeah, yeah. Le- Leslie's fantastic. You are just some brilliant people. Thank you so much for being involved with our lives, Dale. Cracking stuff, I believe, is the phrase. Mm. And we will see the rest of you next time. Force Majeure is played using the Star Wars Force and Destiny game system by Fantasy Flight Games and Lucas Books. Our intro music for this season is Unholy Night by Kevin MacLeod, and our outro music remains Suburban Outlaw by Forget the Whale, both used with gratitude under the Creative Commons license. If you like the show and want to interact with us, we are on Twitter, we are on Facebook, we are on Instagram, all of which are at Force Majeure Pod though Twitter is probably where you're going to find us more regularly. If you enjoy what we do and want to support the show, there's three ways you can do that. The first is via our Patreon at patreon.com slash forcemajeurepod. The second is by buying us a coffee at ko-fi.com slash forcemajeurepod. And the third way is by rating and reviewing us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, anywhere where you can find us. We really like reviews. It tells us that we're telling the stories that you want to hear and helps other people find us. Thank you very much for listening. We'll see you next time.